Um, I traveled lots of places, I think, um, through my career to give talks, uh, as I'm doing today. I have to say that it's very special to be in Jerusalem. Uh, I feel very humble to be here. So thank you very much. I wanted to talk a bit about me, but I think that you did a terribly good job. <laughs> um, I just want to point out before I start um, that I am a scientist. So um, that's what I do. I do research. I am not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a geneticist. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a social worker. And I'm not a sociologist either. I am a researcher, so um, I try to combine all these different disciplines when I investigate mental health problems. So I am a researcher who investigates the origin of mental health um, problem. And I have to uh, apologize um, to start with because I'm going to show you lots of graphs and tables um, and results. Um, but we're going to go through them, you know, slowly. Um, it should be absolutely fine. And I apologize as well because the findings make me speak. You know, that's what is driving me and that what I want to share with you. Um, one weakness that I have is that I am quite often driven by the results and I lack maybe a bit of theoretical background or a model that some of the people uh, that I've seen in the past two days are very rich of. I'm not like this. I, I like child maltreatment, you have mental health problems, and I try to understand how this works together. Um, and that's what I'm planning to, um, to do today. I also wanted to mention that my training, although I'm a researcher, my, my basic training was in psychoeducation. I'm not sure whether it's a known discipline here. It's a combination of education and psychology. So I was basically trained at working with people with behavioral problems. And after doing it for a few years, I realized that I, that I didn't have much to offer them um, as a person. So I decided to study instead because Probably by, by building a set of knowledge, I would end up kind of helping them a little bit more. And after doing research on mental health for 20 years, I come up with the same conclusion. I don't have that much to offer to these people again. So I feel stuck. Um, <laughs> recently, I was appointed as the Mental Health Leadership Fellow by the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK. So that is one of the most important research council, a funding bodies that gives grants to people who want to do research on social science and economic science. And suddenly I feel that maybe again I have a chance to kind of make a difference uh, by influencing research, you know, and what it focuses on. So wish me luck. Um, <laughs> I work a lot with the government, uh, so, so it's um, not always fun. <laughs> um, great. As some of you already know, um, I my main focus uh, of my work for the past few years have been to study bullying victimization. So kids who've been victimized by their peers and trying to understand the impact on their mental health um, problem. And I extended that uh, form of victimization to include maltreatment um, as well. So I know a little bit about maltreatment too. Um, and I often kind of introduce myself as being, you know, someone who does bullying research. Uh, but in the recent years, I started doing much more work on social relationships and the environment in general, um, trying to understand how social relationships could be harmful in the case of bullying and maltreatment, but also how it can be helpful and mitigate the harmful outcome of being either maltreated or being bullied. So maybe I should redefine myself after this meeting as someone who study um, the impact of um, social relationships on mental health problems, whether they are these relationships or this environment is um, good or bad. Now I have a few things ahead of me, so this is it. Um, <clears throat> oh, there you go. Darn, that's a good start. So I've been studying bullying and now I'm studying good relationship, that's it. Okay, so my talk will cover three um, important themes. Um, and the first one will be maltreatment. And thank you, Asher, for um, giving some background. Um, I don't think I'm the right person to be standing in front of you and telling you that maltreatment is um, something that we should all aim to stop and that um, we need to kind of get together, as you mentioned, to um, um, 
again, buffer the impact of those who don't escape um, maltreatment um, or bullying. We also know that the physical injuries of, of um, maltreatment do not, uh, are not limited to um, as one of the outcome of, of maltreatment. There's much more outcomes, uh, poor outcomes associated with maltreatment, which you know, kind of covers mental health outcome, but also social development, behavior, and um, substance use problem. Um, it's important to mention as well that um, child maltreatment, although it's um, relatively common, uh, according to uh, various surveys, um, official cases tell only a small part of the whole story. So lots of cases do not get reported to official um, either agencies such as um, social services or even the police. So we have to um, work harder, I think, at being able to detect um, maltreatment among youth. Another theme of my um, talk will be associated outcomes, and that's a little bit funny because um, yesterday we had a, a workshop with Asher at the end, and it was saying that we have to be a little bit more innovative, you know, in what we're doing with um, research on child maltreatment, and saying that it's harmful, being maltreated is not good for you, is, you know, not quite um, novel. Um, so I'm afraid that there will be a little bit of outcomes in my presentation, which will not surprise you. Um, but I will specifically look at the intergenerational transmission of maltreatment, which is something that has not been looked very often. Um, so the extent to which one generation suffering from abuse uh, is more at risk of having uh, or producing another generation of children who also will experience uh, victimization. So I will be focusing on that. And finally, um, in the two studies that I will present to you today, I will um, investigate the effect of um, safe, um, safe nurturing and stable relationship and how that can mitigate the impact of being um, victimized. And I take the word social relationship in the broad sense, so I don't want to um, limit my analyses to just a one-to-one -one interaction or uh, individual interactions, but also in the context of systems. So I'm interested in looking into neighborhood as well, um, because I think that neighborhood and community is a form of relationship, and it does also convey a sense of safety, of stability, and of um, nurturing. The studies I, um, I will present, um, they have been conducted in collaboration with the CDC, so the Center for Disease uh, Control and Prevention, who has um, childhood maltreatment on their um, list of, um, of things that they have to, um, there is a language you know, which is very typical to American agency, and I don't know what it is, surveillance list. So they, they they kind of keep monitoring maltreatment because they consider that it is a source of, um, of poor outcome in, um, in the society. So basically, and what the CDC was interested in was um, to look for people who had data on child maltreatment across different generations, and they wanted to find um, they wanted to find measures of relationship that could break this cycle um, of transmission of maltreatment. And what they believe is that safe, stable, nurturing relationship in the caregiving and broader environment um, are the foundational essential for healthy child growth and development and also for building better employees, safer communities, stronger economy, and stronger future parents. Um, I don't care that much about these outcomes. I think that we have to protect children, and that's good enough for me that we should look into it. Um, but I, I do appreciate the support that we had from the CDC, and I think it's worth uh, mentioning them at the beginning of this talk. What I also need to mention is the collaborators who work with me. Um, so when we work f with the CDC, we were um, four representative, well, representative of four different cohorts. Um, three, I think it's easier if I use this one, yeah. Um, yes. Um, 
so there were three cohorts from the US and um, we were only the only one from the UK. And I must acknowledge the, the work from my colleague here, Sarah Jeffy, who conducted with me um, this work. Um, although Sarah Jaffe is based in the US uh, at UPenn, she was working with us on the E-Risk study, which is based um, in the UK. But there were other cohorts as well who were involved. So the Rochester Youth Development Study, the Iowa Youth Family Study uh, with um, Ren Conger, and then you had the Lehigh Longitudinal Study. So all these four studies had data on maltreatment across two and sometimes three generations. So I think that the Rochester Youth Development Study, um, they had data across three generations. So, um, so we worked together and we've published um, studies um, in a special issue of the Journal of Adolescence, Adolescent Research, um, and those studies appeared in 2013. Um, but I really need to acknowledge the uh, contribution of my, my colleague Sarah Jeffy here. Okay, so I will present you findings from two different studies, and the first study aim to answer the question, do safe, stable, nurturing relationships break the cycle of violence from one generation to the next? And I will try to do this by first providing estimates of the magnitude of the intergenerational transmission of maltreatment, and also by identifying factors that distinguish families in which the cycle of abuse was broken from families in which it was maintained. I didn't do anything. <laughs> Sorry, it was working so well. Ah, okay, je touche pas lui. Non, non, je suis assez le mien. Ah, okay. It's fantastic. We speak in French now. <laughs> I can speak anyway? Yes, yes. Perfect, okay. Um, <clears throat> and before we go any further, I want to introduce the sample. So I'm very lucky to work in a beautiful cohort that we have in the UK. Some of you already uh, know about it. It's the Environmental Risk Longitudinal Twin Study, which is um, a sample of 1,116 families with same-sex twins who were born between 1994 and 1995, either in England and Wales. So our sample comprised 2,232 kids. Um, our sample overrepresents a, a proportion of mom who were young when they gave birth to their um, first child. And we do this because quite often in twin samples, older mothers are overrepresented because they go through um, they are more educated, <laughs> they, um, they go to work, they work really hard, and they tend to delay having kids, and they end up having more money and provide a better environment to the kids. So we had to counterbalance that fact, and we oversample um, young mums in, in, in our sample. We have a fair proportion of families in our sample who live um, under really difficult circumstances, so they make less than 10,000 uh, pounds um, a year, which is <clears throat> very, very um, low, if you know how um, cost of living in London is. Um, and our sample is divided you know, between boys and girls, basically. And I have to emphasize the fact that we have twins in this study, which is a real advantage when you want to control for genetic influence. And I'm not going to talk about this um, right now. For this, for this study, I don't make the most of the twin design. Um, but in lots of our study, we do. We control for genetic findings, which is um, confounders, which is a, a real value. In, its, in this study, the fact that we have two kids in one family uh, kind of um, presents some kind of a, an extra challenge for me. So then when we talk about transmission from one generation to the next, the next generation will basically be whether one of the twins has been victim of maltreatment. So um, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, a mother and a child. In the case of our study, we have one generation which is one mom, and the next generation is two kids, basically. 
So we have a longitudinal study which started when the kids were age, uh, well, we have information from the kids when they were born, and we also collected information from a different study um, which also surveys those twins um, when they were age two. But the e-risk study started when the twins were age five. So actually, when I, I moved to London, um, so I've been collaborating with this study since um, its very beginning. So we got funding from the Medical Research Council to um, set up this study uh, with the collaboration, of course, of uh, Moffitt and Caspi, um, who were my mentors back then. And we visited the twins when they were age five and again at age seven. And we got further funding to follow up the twins. And we saw them again when they were 10 and again at the, when they were 12. And at that point, my mentors kind of decided to go back in the US. I stayed in London and I took over the leadership of this study. And I led the following phase of data collection, which took place when the twin were 18. Um, it was very um, interesting to see the kids, you know, when I first started, they were five and, and then they were um, 18. And I can tell you as well that we are already thinking about the next generation because there's a fair proportion of them at age 18. And now, you know, <laughs> since the last data collection, which ended in 2014, more and more of them have kids. So um, it will be interesting to think about, um, you know, the third generation in our, um, in our sample. Um, I have to mention an interesting fact in our study, which I'm very proud of, is the high retention rate um, of our study. So when the twins were um, kids at age 12, 96% of our cohort still took part in the study. And when they gave consent themselves at age 18, 93% still took part in this study. Um, and it is a, an impressive number, I have to say, in all modesty, but it does involve a lot of work and a lot of money. So it is doable. <laughs> you just have to put this as a priority in your agenda. But it is doable. So whenever I meet other researchers you know, who estimate some kind of a retention rate of 80, it always kind of you know, one makes me scream, it's, it's not right. You, you, can, you can do it, you can achieve it. At the very beginning of the, um, the study, we focused a lot on asking questions to mums, um, and we did get the kids involved in the assessment, but because they were so young, we limited, you know, the time that we spent with them. We asked also mothers permission to contact teachers so we have information um, from the teachers about the kids' development. At age 12, when they were getting a little bit older, yeah, you cannot see it, yeah. When they were getting older, then we started to get them a little bit more involved in the assessment because we knew that we would see them at age 18. So at age 12, we got more involved in the assessment and we asked um, questions to them. We've collected DNA, we have uh, lots of um, measures of biomarkers in our sample, but one of the very interesting um, features that we have as well, we have very strong measures of the neighborhood. So when the twins were age seven, and again when they were age 12, we've identified 15 neighbors, and we send them questionnaires, and we ask them to rate the safety and the atmosphere of the neighborhood. Um, and we have, so we have a, a very strong kind of uh, bank of data about um, the quality of the neighborhood of those children in which they, um, in which they grew up. Um, Yes. Okay. Do you have any questions about the sample? Mm -hmm. Yes? What about fathers? Ah, good question. <laughs> um, yes, unfortunately, we don't have any data on, on fathers. In a study like this, it's extremely difficult to get the fathers involved, and quite often, um, we are not too sure who is the man in the, in the house. <laughs> so, um, so we would want to have, you know, a perspective of someone else. Um, and we did a small study, so there are a fair proportion of fathers who want to get involved. When we visit them, they say, what about us? And we always bring, we always bring kind of um, spare questionnaires. And if they want to get involved, we ask them to uh, fill a questionnaire. And we did a small study of comparing, you know, rating from the fathers and, and um, the mothers. Um, but overall, they're a little bit, yeah, it's difficult to assess. We don't know who they are. We don't know how long they known the kids for. So in terms of evaluation, you know, it does introduce a little bit of, um, um, yes, 
of vagueness in the data. So, it, it, but it is a weakness in, in our study. It would be great to have that. Okay. So when the kids were age 12, um, we asked, sorry, it's, it's an interesting feature for me to present those uh, findings because I am always used to uh, provide data on the twins, so I always refer to the twins. This study, these two studies are a bit special in the e-risk study because the focus is also on the mums. So I keep on referring to the twins um, because to me it's always kind of the landmark, but bear in mind here that the important participants are also uh, the mums. So when we saw the twins, when we saw the families um, at age 12, we asked mothers about their own experience of maltreatment in their childhood, and we used the Childhood Trauma Questionnaire, which asked about five forms of abuse and neglect. As you probably all know, it asked about emotional, physical, sexual abuse, and it also asked about emotional and physical neglect. For this study, we derive a cumulative exposure index for each woman by counting the number of maltreatment categories present. So if they've experienced three different types of abuse, they got a score of three. If they experience all of those forms of abuse, they get a score of five, basically. Um, yes, I will show you. So overall, there's 75% of the mothers in e-risk, of those 1,000 um, mothers who didn't experience any form of um, maltreatment in their childhood. However, we have 17% who experienced moderate maltreatment, and moderate maltreatment is one or two different types of maltreatment. And 8% experienced severe maltreatment, and severe maltreatment is three or more different types of um, maltreatment. Now, through the years, when the twins were age 5, 7, 10, and 12, we asked repeatedly to the mothers about the children's experience with maltreatment. Um, now, this assessment is... is really important because we ask mothers themselves about maltreatment. And I have to point out the fact that at the very beginning of this part of the interview, we always convey to the mom that we have an ethical and legal duty to report any cases that we feel, you know, um, um, have to be reported to social services. Um, otherwise, all the information that they give us is confidential, but at this point we have to stop and we have to kind of explain to them what is going on. We also reassure the mom that we don't want to know who was the perpetrator of maltreatment, we want to know whether the kid experienced maltreatment. So to just establish some kind of um, uh, uh, confidence, you know, that they need to feel comfortable about revealing whether the kids have been victims um, of maltreatment or not. Um, and we did that repeatedly over time, and quite often, we don't ask necessarily the time, so quite often, mums would tell us uh, at age 10 about experiences that happen um, really kind of uh, earlier on. We kind of rule out, um, we probe, when mom revealed that there was some maltreatment, that the twins experienced maltreatment, we rule out situation when it was accidental harm, so, you know, it was an accident, basically, or when harm was uh, caused by a peer or someone in the, a sibling, so we call this bullying, so we ruled this out um, as well. And we've included sexual abuse that was queried separately, but that was included as well. So um, in this case, maltreatment includes sexual uh, abuse too. Um, and because we kept those um, information through the lifespan, so um, at the first time when we asked the mom, when the twins were age five, the, the reporting period covered birth. So by age 12, we have a measure of child maltreatment which covered from birth up to age um, 12. Whenever the moms reported an instance that a child was maltreated, we instructed the interviewers to 
probe and to take notes. So when the mums was asking questions, they would take note. They would bring back the information in the office and with a panel of experts, including um, psychologists, we would uh, review the notes and determine whether we felt strongly that this was a case of maltreatment. And we categorize um, the cases you know, in probable maltreatment or definite maltreatment. And definite maltreatment was there you know, when we knew that the police has been notified, whether the social services was notified. But in some cases, you know, the information provided some, some hints that there was some maltreatment, but we were not too, um, too sure. And we kind of um, <clears throat> looked at that separately at first. Examples of maltreatment in our study included smack the child weakly, leave marks or bruises, a child that was repeatedly beaten by a young adult or a step-sibling, um, child that was routinely smacked by father when drunk just to humiliate him, child who was funded um, sexually or often slapped by mother's boyfriend. Um, so yeah, many cases were already um, you know, investigated by social services, but not all of them. And the good thing was that we never had to report a case, you know, to social services or to the police because most, you know, there was always, you know, often services involved, you know, in the cases. So it was, um, it was all right. So for this study, we looked at together the kids who were probably or definite, um, definitely um, uh, abused, physically abused, um, and you can see that, similarly to moms, 74% of the twins didn't experience uh, maltreatment, but in 27, 26% uh, of the cases, uh, we could identify kids who were either probably or definitely uh, maltreated. Overall, there are 71% of the families who didn't experience maltreatment in either generation, either with the mom or either with um, the kids. But what I'm interested in is to look at the transmission from one generation to the next. So what you can see here <clears throat> is that there is a substantial uh, transmission or continuity of abuse from one generation to the next. So amongst the 178 mothers who reported a history of moderate physical maltreatment, uh, maltreatment, not necessarily just physical, but moderate maltreatment in childhood, 46% of them had at least one twin who experienced physical maltreatment by the time that they reach age 12. So for 54% of those mothers, both child escaped maltreatment. So mothers with a history of mild or moderate maltreatment were nearly or you know, were 3.5 times more likely to have at least one child who experienced physical maltreatment compared to mothers who didn't have a history of child maltreatment. When you look at those mothers who experienced severe maltreatment, so among the 81 mothers who reported a history of severe abuse in childhood, 56% had at least one twin child who experienced physical maltreatment. And mothers who experienced severe abuse in their childhood were five times, more than five times, more likely to have at least a child who experienced physical maltreatment by the time that they reach um, 12. Now for this study, given that the risk, there's a significant risk of transmission of maltreatment from one generation to the next for mothers who experience either uh, moderate or severe maltreatment, we will collapse them and we were going to consider 24% of women who experience uh, any maltreatment and I will create four groups to really um, investigate the transmission of maltreatment. So you have here 61% um, of um, families in the total sample who haven't experienced any maltreatment at all. You have um, the cycle breakers, so where only mom has experienced maltreatment, so the children have escaped maltreatment, and they represent 13% of the whole sample. You have the cycle maintainers, so this is continuity of childhood maltreatment from one generation to the next, and they represent 12% of the sample. And then you have 
new cases of kids who've been maltreated. So mom was not maltreated, but the, chi the children are. Uh, so we call them a group of 14 uh, new maltreated cases, and they represent 14% of the sample. And I will not look at them today. What I will really want to focus on is making the distinction or try to identify whether there are any factors, protective factors or risk factors that can distinguish the cycle maintainers and the cycle breakers. So what breaks the cycle of violence? And to do this, Sarah and I kind of um, looked at different um, types of variables and we've looked at um, economic or human capitals so um, SES being one of them, for example, uh, or disadvantage, so we can make disadvantage is one of them, and also interpersonal relationships. And we group those factors into two different types. Either you have a risk factor or you can have a protective factors. So you can see on the left-hand side those negative factors which would, in some ways, maintain that cycle. They would increase the risk for mothers to have kids who experience maltreatment as well. So you have socioeconomic disadvantage, mother's lifetime depression, parental, uh, parents' antisocial personality, parents' substance abuse, domestic partner violence, mother's low, low social support, and low neighborhood collective efficacy. On the other hand, on the right hand side, you have positive factors that are likely to break the cycle. So you have socioeconomic advantage, high sibling warmth, high maternal warmth, healthy partner relationships, mother's high social support, and high neighborhood collective efficacy. You can see that there are some factors that are represented in both the positive and the negative side of things. And that could be a, something that you could question, you know, how can it be both? Um, and it is, it is something that we could, um, you could argue, but we think that basically you could have um, low neighborhood, uh, neighborhood collective efficacy, you know, and you do have, you know, some of it and it's really great, but in some instance you may have a lack of it which is really harmful, or you can live, you know, in an environment which is extremely kind of cohesive, you know, where people support each other, they would stop kids, you know, from being truant, or if someone needs help, you know that your neighbors would be there to help, and that would be great, so that is a protective factor. Um, so we consider those, those two sides. So extreme being either a risk factor or the high end being a protective factor. Um, yes. There was something, I cannot um, think about it. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you at first, um, before I, I look at the contrast between the maintainers and the breakers, is to look at the prevalence of, I just want to see whether those factors are associated with mom's history of child uh, maltreatment. So as you would expect, here I'm presenting the findings with the risk factors. So what you would expect here would see that we have a higher prevalence of mothers who experience maltreatment for those risk factors. And that's exactly what you see. You can see that mothers with maltreatment are overrepresented here amongst women with uh, depression, with um, you know, parents who have substance abuse, domestic violence, Women with experience maltreatment are overrepresented um, amongst those um, uh, who have antisocial personality disorders, amongst those who live in poor SES areas as well, or low collective efficacy neighborhood as well. And mo mothers with maltreatment tend to have less social support too. Now, are these factors also associated with children, childhood maltreatment, so they're kids? And yes, except for low collective efficacy, all those risk factors are also associated with um, child, children's maltreatment. And you can see that you have a dose-response relationship as well. The more risk factors that you have, and the more you have, um, you have this uh, transmission of maltreatment from one generation to the next. So if families have um, more of these um, factors, then more likely to have this transmission um, from one generation. When we look at the promotive factor, those, so those posi positive kind of factors, we find similar um, trend as well. All these factors seem to be associated with um, 
uh, mother's maltreatment, but on the other way around, uh, you know, of course, is the flip side. So you can see that you have a lower prevalence of moms with maltreatment, you know, in the, among those moms with high um, sibling, high um, maternal warmth. Oh, sorry, it's not significant. With high sibling warmth, or you have a lower um, prevalence of mom who experienced uh, maltreatment among those who are in um, dangerous kind of relationships. So in some ways, oh, that's what I wanted to say, that the choice of those factors, basically, um, they are really based on what the evidence, what other studies have shown before. So we've selected them based on previous findings. And our find, our, the, study from, um, the results from our study basically show that, yeah, like the others, you know, these factors are associated with mom's maltreatment or also children's maltreatment. Um, and this is, this is the other, um, the promotive factors are also associated with childhood maltreatment. Now the question is whether they will um, break the cycle. Oh, and then you have a, um, you have a dose relationship as well with the risk of transmitting um, maltreatment from one generation to the next. There you go. This is the answer to um, whether, which factors can break the cycle. So you compare the cycle breakers to the cycle maintainers. When you look at them in bivariate analysis, so just the two together, just one variable, one by one, you can, all those factors are associated basically, but when you put them together, because we want to have an independent effect, which, you know, one factor independent of the others would help breaking this cycle, you can see that we have three, there should be an, a non-significant here, I'm sorry, it, I couldn't put it, I don't know why. Um, but you can see that maternal warmth, having a good partner relationship, and a lack, so intimacy, having an intimate kind of relationship with your partner, so you spend time together, you enjoy doing things together, and also an absence of domestic violence, so, you know, not may, probably not having a partner who may be the abuser of a child, all this protect the children from experiencing maltreatment when the mothers have experienced maltreatment. So all these effects are independent. Independent of each other, they, um, they help young kids to escape maltreatment when their mom have had maltreatment. So from this study, we can conclude that safe and nurturing relationships between intimate partner and between mothers and children, distinguished families in which the intergenerational transmission of maltreatment is maintained from families in which the cycle is broken. Our findings would emphasize the potential benefit of supporting mothers with a history of childhood abuse to foster safe, stable, nurturing relationships to prevent future abuse to their children. So I think it's interesting because when you, you try to think about intervention programs, you probably can think that instead of blaming the moms, you know, and try to use a punitive um, uh, intervention towards the mom, you can encourage them to develop positive relationship, to develop a social network around them, because this is a way for breaking this cycle. The other question I wanted to ask in terms of the positive aspect of relationship on the outcome associated with um, being maltreated um, relates to, I want to go beyond this kind of transmission now, and I want to look at mom's outcome. So going back a little bit to what Asher was saying yesterday, that we know that um, women who experience, um, or people who experience childhood maltreatment, they will develop um, poor outcome. I had to test this in the sam our sample as well, but what I wanted to see was whether I could find, again, safe, supportive, and nurturing relationship could buffer the effect of maltreatment on those mother's um, outcome. Does that make sense? Perfect. Um, for this study, I didn't go through all my list of protective factors that I showed you in the previous study. I limited the, um, because I know that at the end, there, there was only a limited 
number that were kind of uh, meaningful. But we've looked for the study at women's social support networks, so how much they perceived that they could get financial support, support for the twins, and emotional support if they needed. So we asked those questions to the mom directly when they, uh, the twins were age 12. We also asked her about her relationship with her partner, so we took that variable on board as well because it seems to be meaningful for the transmission. And we also look at the absence of domestic violence in a relationship, because this one was also um, important for the transmission, the previous study. So we took on board these three um, um, protective factors. I call them protective factors in, in a loose sense. Um, <clears throat> in our sample, there's only 8% um, that, that had all these protective factors. Um, well, no, let me start with the beginning. There's only 20%, so it was fairly common, basically, to have these protective factors, or at least one of them. There's only 20% of the mothers in our sample who didn't have any of those protective factors. But we have 46, so nearly half of them who had at least one protective factor, one of those three that I just mentioned. And then we had 34 who had two or more, and amongst them, so we had 8% who had all of them, so they are super protected somehow. And because there were only 8%, we decided to combine them with those who had two to create a group of 34% of our sample who had, um, who had at least two of these protective factors. And I looked at three different types of outcomes in women. We've looked at mental health outcome, physical health outcome, health risk behavior. So we've looked at the risk for moms who have a childhood history of maltreatment, history of childhood maltreatment, <laughs> to have depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, or psychosis spectrum disorder. We've looked at their general health, how much they rated their health to be good, whether they had serious problems, or whether they felt limited to do kind of normal activities around the, ho the house, like hoovering, for example, because of their health. And finally, we've looked at health risk behaviors, such as antisocial behavior, substance use problem, problems, or um, food insecurity. So it's mothers who don't have enough money to be able to, um, to meet all the bills. So, um, so they don't, they're not sure that they will be able to provide food for the family and for, for themselves. You can see here on that um, slide that the mothers who've experienced childhood maltreatment have been, you know, they are overrepresented amongst those who have depression, anxiety, psychosis, and sleep problem. So in terms of their um, physical health and their mental health, they're not doing too well. They also have, here on the y-axis, I present effect sizes. So which kind of just illustrate the association between having a childhood history of maltreatment and those different outcomes. So they have higher rates of functional limitation. They have more antisocial behavior, more substance use problem, and more general health. Um, they rate their health as being poor um, too. Now I want to see whether having a lot of those uh, protective factors would reduce the effect of childhood maltreatment on those poor outcomes. And we did find significant effects, so a buffering effect, on five um, outcomes. <clears throat> oh, there you go. So the first one would be um, major depression. So here you can see that the bars um, represent having no protective factors at all, the gray bar having one protective factor, and the, the dark bar having two or more protective factors. And then on the left-hand side, you have those women with no history of childhood maltreatment. On the right-hand side, women with a childhood, uh, history, a childhood history of maltreatment. You can see that having two or more protective factors or having those protective factors didn't have much of an effect among those who didn't experience maltreatment. But you see a clear effect, I mean, this is textbook effect, amongst those women who experience maltreatment. If you have one protective effect, you have a reduced risk of having major depression. And if you have two or more of these protective factors, you have, again, a lower risk of having major depression. Yes. 
We have exactly the same effect when we look at antisocial behavior. There's no effect of those protective factors when you look at women who didn't have maltreatment, but there's a clear effect amongst those who have experienced maltreatment. Same thing when we look at substance use problems. Same thing when you look at their women's rating of general health. So that's why the bar goes the other way around. So higher, uh, better health. And then sleep problems. And you can see here that there's a steep effect, you know, of having those protective factors on moms, you know, who experience um, sleep um, problem. I must tell you as well that when you look at one of these factors, those protective factors separately, they don't have that much of an effect. But when you put them together, that is when you have this effect. So there's not one factor here, either the relationship with the partner, either the, the absence of domestic violence or the social network that is driving those findings. This is really the cumulative effect of all of them. So in conclusion, we can say that women who have a history of abuse or neglect have an elevated risk uh, for mental and physical health problems. If, however, women's current social circumstances are sufficiently positive, they can promote good health, particularly in the face of um, past adversity. And I think that this is important, basically, because there is an increasing desire to um, detect women um, who are at risk of having these uh, problems in the primary care, so with the doctors. So I think it's really important to train doctors to be really comfortable to ask very sensitive questions um, to those women to be able to detect whether they've experienced a maltreatment and whether they suffer for these, um, from these uh, problems. I just want to highlight that uh, I really love our study, um, but <laughs> we do have limitations that you probably have spot on already. So our measure of um, maltreatment amongst the mom uh, were retrospective, um, so this is something, but we've used a well-validated instrument, and our um, rate of maltreatment in those women match those of other study. We have a sample of twins, and we have mothers of twins, and some people may say, well, it, it's probably kind of different, you know. However, um, if we look at the prevalence of maltreatment of the women, again, it's the same, and the prevalence of childhood maltreatment amongst our twins, it's also comparable to other studies of singletons. Um, another limitation is that we don't know who was the perpetrator of, um, of the maltreatment. Um, for us, it was really a compromise that we had to make to be able to get the information. Um, but we cannot really talk about um, transmission um, because it could be another adult. You know, it's not necessarily kind of um, a blood transmission. Um, the uh, maltreatment amongst the second generation could have been done by a, a neighbor or a teacher. Um, mother's reports, um, yeah, the mother's report of child maltreatment. So we have their, um, their perspective as well. And as you know, their perspective or their report could be biased by their psychopathology or by um, you know, them not wanting to reveal um, this as well. Uh, we didn't ask as well about father's experience of maltreatment. So it's possible that our group are not necessarily perfect because there could have been some cases of breakers or maintainers that were not captured because we didn't get fathers. It's possible that, you know, there are cases of fathers that we can um, um, detect. Um, we didn't ask questions about all the children in the family. It's possible that in those who didn't have any maltreatment, twins were not maltreated, but maybe someone else in the family was maltreated, and we didn't have that. Again, you know, I just want to highlight the fact that we're using the absence of risk um, and also kind of protective factors, and that could be um, questions. And we don't know whether these protective factors uh, do extend to women who didn't have any children. Um, because there are some women who experience maltreatment, end up not having children, and it is not clear whether these protective factors um, could extend to them as well. I just want to um, thank the, um, the e-risk study. So this is the team who collected the data um, at age, um, when the twins were age 18, and without them, this study would not be possible. And thank you.
very much, Louise. Um, we have a few minutes for uh, questions you have or comments. If you like, does anybody have a comment? Saying that was fascinating. Great, thank you. And uh, it's interesting to understand that it sounds like you had a very uh, secure relationship with the families, like mm. you come to home visits. Yeah. And you maintain relationships with them. Yep. And I'm wondering how it impacts the reports. Maybe it was kind of intervention on child treatment. <laughs> you know, because we did really, really home visiting. Um. I'm not sure that the fact that we, we don't have any, con well, we do send birthday cards, but we don't have any personal contact, you know, in between phases. And I don't, th I think that childhood maltreatment is something which is so ugh, powerful, I'm, you know, and it's something which is so difficult to stop. I'm sure that people who try to stop maltreatment would say, you know, I've been trying, I, we try everything to stop maltreatment and it doesn't work. Um, I doubt that having someone, a stranger, coming in for two hours would kind of have this effect that we're all after, basically. Having said that, I, I think that you're right, that probably, you know, the fact that the twins are involved in this study may have an impact, you know, on their well-being or, you know, on their confidence. Um, the research workers are instructed not to intervene. So uh, they are there to collect the data. They don't intervene. In cases where they are... Um, serious concern, they bring back their concern to the um, office and we have a team of uh, professional, mental health professional who would take a decision whether we need to intervene. Um, but yeah, I cannot rule out that there could be a, an effect. I doubt it has an effect on, on maltreatment. Thank you. Um, I'm just really interested in effective interventions then. I was at a conference at Grant Makers and Aging where they presented a Bridge Meadows, a really interesting model where they built a city block that had low-income seniors that wanted to be part of the intentional community, together with foster families, so it was a forever home for the foster children. And it made me think that uh, with a lot of community support and the volunteer social worker support and, uh, you know, somebody helping the elders effectively work with the families, but it made me think that that kind of model with um, at-risk mothers where there's a community support. Do we know much about these kinds of models, it was my first. Um, I, I think that we, not at the community level, I think that we did survey some intervention more at the individual levels. You know, kind of, um, instead of targeting, or not only targeting the children, we also target, you know, when we have, you know, experiences of maltreatment, we focus not only on the kid, but we try to support the mums as well. So there are intervention in that, at that level. But I'm not sure that we know about any effect of community level, you know, on the rates of child maltreatment. But this is something definitely that more and more so now I think that we should think about knowing that there's a huge impact of the neighborhood, the community on mental health problems. Um, so there would definitely... Absolutely, yes. They say it takes a village when you have kids. There, there you go. <laughs> the last question from Paula. Uh, two. Uh, twins, as a twin. Oh. Uh, Yeah, there were a f there are a few instances where both twins were maltreated. We couldn't look at them kind of um, individually, and you know I don't remember. I could go back to the paper to kind of rem uh, to look it up, um, but we had a few of them where the two twins. We we know that you know maltreatment um, tends to occur in families. So if you if you look at the two twins, quite often. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.